Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us across the great Louisiana plain where we are elevating the cause of freedom and liberty in the state of Louisiana, marching relentlessly down the field of liberty, headed toward glorious victory, and slowly but surely, day by day, draining the Louisiana swamp. My name is Chris. And I'm Danielle, and this is the State of Freedom, brought to you by freedom-loving Louisiana First Patriots. Hello, State of Freedom warriors. We we just love you so much. We're so grateful for you. We're so honored that you would have us along for part of your day, part of your commute, or, or your errand running. We are only here because of your encouragement, your prayers, your friendship, your financial support. If you are looking for a way to support us, to advertise with us, or to send us feedback, please visit our website at freedomstate.us. We'd love it if you'd help us get the word out and help us spread the reach of the state of freedom. Please like the show on whatever platform you listen to us, subscribe to it, share it, and don't forget that we're on YouTube and Rumble as well if you want to see us over there. The links to those are always in the show notes and over on freedomstate.us. Moms for Liberty East Baton Rouge Parish Chapter is dedicated to fighting for the survival of America by unifying, educating, and empowering parents to defend and take back their parental rights at all levels of government. To learn more or to get involved with Moms for Liberty East Baton Rouge, email momsforlibertybatonrouge at gmail.com. That's moms, the number four, Liberty Baton Rouge at gmail.com. The email address is on the Patriot page of our website, freedomstate.us, and it's in the show notes. Well, before we get into the bills, we will look at the scripture of the day. Let me read that now. It's Psalm chapter 71, verses 19 through 21. And it says, For your glorious righteousness reaches up to the high heavens. No one could ever be compared to you. Who is your equal, O God of marvels and wonders? Even though you've let us sink down with trials and troubles, I know you will revive us again, lifting us up from the dust of death. Give us even more greatness than before. Turn and comfort us once again. And during a recent time of fasting and prayer that was coordinated by a group that many of you know that I'm a part of, We the People by You community, the Lord had me bring Psalm 71, the whole chapter, as a prayer to pray from the perspective of America as a nation. And I would encourage you to read it aloud as a prayer for our country as often as you can. But in looking at this small passage of it, we can say without hesitation that the Lord has absolutely allowed us to sink down with trials and troubles. But let's be men and women of faith who know just as definitively that he will revive us again. He will lift us up and he is lifting us up from the dust of death. He will give us even more greatness as a nation and as a people than before. And he is turning toward us to comfort us once again. We will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I'm convinced of that. You know, Danielle, it's a feeling that I get as I look around and I see things developing, see the way things are unfolding in the country now. Uh, I I sense a real reawakening. I sense a real movement, a real revival back toward God. I think people are becoming more and more informed about some of the sinister forces arrayed against us. And I just think the Holy Spirit is active and moving throughout the country, particularly among young people. Um, Charlie Kirk said recently that a substantial percentage of young men now between the age of 18 and 30 are conservative, constitutional conservatives, and understand what's happening in the country and are rebelling against a lot of this woke garbage that's going down. A lot of great signs. I think the Holy Spirit is moving, and I do agree that God is lifting us up from the dust of death by by revealing the truth about things that, that a lot of the bad actors don't want us to know. I think that they're probably... They're petrified about a lot of things, Danielle, but one of the big things that the the bad forces and the bad actors are more scared of than anything else is having their crimes exposed. And I believe that, that, that they are becoming more and more exposed by the day. They are. Well, and I'm looking forward. I mean, 
you know, we've wanted to see exposure for a long time. And many of us have prayed for exposure for a long time, at least since around the 2020 timeframe for, for some people, maybe before that. And as we see these exposures, you know, I kind of thought I would like cheer and be excited about it, but every one of them just kind of disgusts me. You know, it's it, the exposures are not a pleasure to watch. You know, whenever you think about praying, you, when you pray for exposure, you think that you're going to be so happy when it finally happens. And the truth is, I, I haven't been. I haven't been, and I have a feeling I will continue not to be excited to see that stuff. But, you know, there's the only way to heal it is to bring it out into the sunshine. And so... Yeah. And, it makes and, you sick. and to get rid of it, you know? Yeah. But, but it, but it makes you, it makes you sick. It makes me yeah. sick when I, when I see uh, some of these things that, that uh, the, the, the depths of depravity uh, that, yeah. that these people will, will go to, you know, uh, I just it's really, true. it's uh it's a uh, just very disheartening, but, but you know what uh, the, the, the silver lining is that the only way to get rid of it, as you said, is to expose it. And I think we yeah. are beginning to do that. Yeah. And there's plenty of silver lining in what's happening at the legislature, Chris. And it's been it's been a very heavy session in terms of workload, in terms of things to follow. You know, I was looking at what all we have been following since the beginning and up until now. And I think the number of bills I counted was in the neighborhood of 130. So, you know, that is just a small slice of the fifteen hundred to two thousand pieces of legislation that probably have been introduced over the course of the session, but we have been working pretty hard and the lift has been pretty heavy and we are really seeing the results of that. We are reaping the benefits of that and will continue to reap the benefits of that as more and more bills make it over to Governor Landry's desk for signature. Yeah, I'm thrilled to death, uh, Danielle, about the way many of these bills have gone down, uh, you know, Edmondson, Kathy Edmondson's uh, HB 47. I know we're going to talk about this evening scheduled for a Senate floor vote. I think tomorrow, this is the third time that representative Edmondson has brought this legislation, very simple, but important legislation. You know, anytime the Louisiana Department of Education sends out notices of immunization requirements or the Louisiana Department of Health, I should say, the parents have a right to know, guess what? You have a right to exempt from these vaccines. She's been fighting to get this into law for three years, and I think we're very, very close now. Yeah. And Chris, maybe before we get into any more bills, I'll just flag for our listeners that we have only two weeks left in the session. The last official day of session is Monday, June 3rd. I will be shocked if we are seeing people showing up at the legislature on Monday, (laughs) June 3rd. I will absolutely be shocked. Everyone is exhausted including the legislators, the legislators, probably most of all the legislators, although I would, I would say that we're pretty, pretty tired too. Um, So we can expect to see a lot of things happen in the next two weeks. And I wouldn't be surprised if we round it out next Thursday or Friday, Chris. Oh, me, me either. Uh, and you know what? Uh, there are days when I feel like the session has gone by very rapidly. And there are days when I feel like uh, the session started about three years ago. But you know what? The fight is always worth it. I love I love being in the fight, being in the battle for the citizens of Louisiana. And I love moving toward the finality of some really, really good results. Yeah, me too. And the bills that we're going to talk about first are bills that are pending final passage in the Senate. All of these bills have been noted as as the fact, well, they say that they're scheduled for Monday. One thing that we've noticed is that even though they may be scheduled for a particular day, when they get called up, Chris, they've been getting objected to. And so they pass over that bill. If, if any bill gets an objection, it gets passed over and they move on to the next one. And this is something called the Bagneris rule that, that they're following, right? It's, yeah. it's a rule that says that they can just move super quickly through a bunch of bills. I think it's, it's a helpful rule in that it expedites the process in case there's, you know, if there's, if it looks like there's going to be a lot of debate or something and they really want to move through a bunch of pieces. However, 
it's slowing down or, or, or skipping over. It's not slowing down. It's skipping over some pretty important bills, many of which um, you may have expected would have been voted on already. However, they have not yet been. So when we say that these are scheduled to be heard on Monday, yes, there's a chance they'll be heard on Monday, but there's also a chance they will not. That's right. And the, the reason why they have the Bagnerish rule, Danielle, as you alluded to, is so, I mean, you know, a lot of the bills that are being, you know, authored and moving through the legislative process are not controversial. They may be important, they may be significant, but they're not controversial. And so I think the Bagneris rule is typically uh, invoked in order to allow bills that are not controversial to get through the process, to get as many of those voted on and out of the way as they can before they begin to debate on on the bills that will require a lot of debate. And I think that's what the Bagneris rule is, but it allows any time a bill is called, uh, it allows any member of the, the Senate, this applies only to the Senate, and it allows any member of the Senate to just press the object button and object uh, to the bill being called and they have to move on. And the, the, the president says, we have an objection. So they move past that bill on to the next one. Uh, and so, but but hopefully, one, I think they're close to getting the non-controversial bills out of the way. So the Bagneris rule should be going away very, very soon, hopefully tomorrow at the latest Tuesday. And they could focus on really debating these bills and getting some of these really important bills passed. Yeah. Agreed. Now, the next bill up, Chris, is House Bill 908 by Representative Beryl Amade. This one is the her anti-discrimination for students um, and bill that, that says that no student can be discriminated against on the basis of their vaccination status. Just treat everybody the same. Whether they've been vaccinated or not, treat everyone the same in school. That's it. No discrimination, no nothing, no more residue of this heavy handed government that we got during COVID uh, with with the pressure to get the COVID shot. Let's put all this in the rearview mirror and treat everybody the same. That's what she's saying. Yeah. Next up is another bill by Representative Amity, House Bill 357. This one would prohibit CBDC as a deposit account. Chris, this is another one that we've seen before. We saw it last session, but this time we expect it to, to make it through the signature process. Yeah, passed overwhelmingly last session, was vetoed by the governor, and it's a very important bill that prohibits central bank digital currency for being included within the definition of a deposit account in Louisiana. Very important bill. Let's get it through and get it signed. Yep. The next bill we are in opposition to, it's House Bill 461 by Representative Jackson. It basically is uh, a bill that would shield certain documents related to parish economic development projects from public view for up to two years. Yeah, up to two years. This is the skunk. My nickname for this bill is the skunk. If That's my right. cell phone bill was the uh, was the cockroach, we'll, we'll call this one the skunk. It's a horrible bill. It shields from public records negotiations between local and municipal governments and private contractors uh, in in uh, infrastructure, economic instru- infrastructure development projects, if the project is valued at over $5 million. Well, I'm sorry, we're talking about taxpayer money. Taxpayers have a right to know what's going on. They have a right to, to records related to these negotiations that involve the expenditure of their money. I don't even know why he's bringing this bill. It looks like they're trying to hide something. It looks like there's an ulterior motive here. It's a terrible piece of legislation. I've called uh, Representative Presley's attention to it and a number of other senators and expressed what a terrible piece of legislation this is. Every day that passes when this is not called, Danielle, in my view, is a good sign that it may uh, suffer uh, the, the the ignominious demise of simply never being called. Yep. Dead on the vine. I like that. An- another one we hope dies on the vine is House Bill 579 by Representative McMahon. And this one would basically authorize pharmacists to dispense HIV treatments, pre-exposure and post-exposure treatments, 
in the pharmacy. And we've talked about this before. We're opposed to it just for very simple reasons. One is that your pharmacist doesn't have your full medical history. I don't know that the pharmacy is really the best setting for this kind of treatment. And, um, you know, I I think as I mentioned last week, it seems like this is something where you'd want a little more, um, you'd want to make sure that the treatment didn't have any uh, adverse effects. And, and, if if there are adverse effects that are found from the treatment, you want to have the equipment there ready to be able to, to respond to the patient's needs. Yeah. I trust, uh, you know, if every, if every pharmacist were like your parents, I would trust them more than I would trust most doctors, but unfortunately they're not. Uh, But uh, let me ask you this, Danielle, do you think there's a chance? We didn't really talk about this last week. There, there would, there's not a chance that this would be like a slippery slope type deal where where you give pharmacists authority this to do this now, and then they slowly but surely uh, legislation more and more to increase, uh, you know, their their authority. Perhaps, perhaps they might, but you know, um, I, I feel like if you think back to the old days where pharmacists, I mean, before before the pharmacies that we know about, right, like the the soda shop type pharmacies that we used to have, you know, the, you watch on TV or you can visit the old relics yes. of them. You're talking about where you were sitting up there on the stool and you and you had a lot the chocolate malt and you and your girlfriend were there and y'all b- both had a straw, but you were both drinking out of the same malt right there. At the, yeah. Maybe, at, maybe you were there. <laughs> I wasn't there, but I used to, I used to watch, watch some of the shows and I would sit there and go, that looks yeah. like that's so much fun. The only problem with that with me is that my girlfriend would be complaining because the thing would be gone so quickly. She wouldn't get any of it. Uh, well, that's so, true. It, I don't share appetizers or desserts. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. But anyway, uh, yes, I know, uh, I know what you're talking about. So you think back to those days and pharmacists did dispense a lot of medicine, uh, probably a lot more medicine without without doctor's prescriptions. But I, I feel like things have gotten so complicated in the last, what, probably 50, 60 years when it comes to medicine, when it comes to FDA regulations, and when it comes to side effects. So, you know, medicine used to be basically herbal and now it's very chemical. And so there's a lot more negative side effects than there there probably used to be with just simple herbal medicine or food based medicine. Um, so yeah, I think maybe if if life was simpler, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But these drugs carry a lot of consequences and have a lot of interactions. And so knowing a full medical history, in my view, is very um, relevant. And it seems like the patient would want that level of um, oversight yeah. for these treatments. Because of, the, because of the dramatically increased risk of harm, potential for yeah. harm. Yeah. That yeah. Makes, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. Well, next up, how, uh, Senate Bill 482 by Senator Cloud. This is her public records bill. And things, Chris, you said are not looking too good for this bill. No, uh, I, I don't think so. Um, it's been pending uh, call in the Senate now for se- for well over a week. And day after day, it, it's not getting it's not getting called. Uh, and it's the bill that uh, would shield certain governor's records uh, from pub- from public scrutiny. Uh, I understand the spirit and the purpose behind the bill with Senator Cloud, but there's a lot of concern about the bill, the way it's phrased at this point. Uh, the argument is that it's going to end up shielding a lot of public records uh, from citizens in Louisiana that re- they really should have access to. Uh, I believe that she's getting a lot of blowback on the bill as evidenced by the fact that Senator M- Jay Morris, who has a similar bill, it's not substantially the same bill, but his bill would have required a person to be a Louisiana citizen in order to make a public records request in Louisiana. And his bill uh, is is dead on the vine. And Jay Morris said on the Senate floor last week that uh, he does, you know, the perception is that uh, not only his legislation, but other legislation related to public records, uh, concealing public records, is being perceived as though they're trying to hide something. And he can't be associated with you know, the perceived effort to try to hide something from the public. So he withdrew his bill, his public records bill. Uh, and I would not be a bit surprised if Senator Heather Cloud's bill uh, heads down the same path. 
Well, Chris, I hope that Senator Jay Morris was on your list of people to to flag that. Um, which bill? What number was it? Four sixty one to the parish economic, parish economic development projects. If he can't stand for his, certainly he won't stand for that one. Senator Morris got was absolutely one who understands how we feel about Jackson's HB four sixty one. Yes, indeed, uh, and and again. Uh, on Senator Heather Cloud's uh, public records bill, I, I do believe that her intention is sincere, uh, but there's just a lot of a lot of concern about the bill, and the general perception now is that they are trying to hide records from the public that the public has a right to know about. That's just where it stands right now. Yeah, and you know, Chris, there are a lot of bills that we end up having these frustrating conversations around where people say the legislators tell us that, you know, this bill just needs more time. We need to work, chop it around. We need to make sure that it hits the right notes and people can, it's palatable for, for all parties. And as annoying and, and teeth gritting as that uh, kind of commentary is to hear on bills that we find to be very important. I think that's probably the category that we could put Senator Cloud's bill in right now. It's just, it's going to take more work. Very, very well said. I think people would be more comfortable putting this off and, and, and seeing what, what, uh, what could be done perhaps next session. Yeah. All right. Well, next up are two bills by Representative Brett Guyman, HB 492 and 966. These are his eminent domain and unitization bills related to carbon dioxide sequestration Excited to see these are moving to final passage. Yeah. And these two bills, Danielle, collectively are going to make it more difficult for uh, green energy companies to expropriate private property for carbon capture sequestration. It's very, very simple. Uh, Brett Guyman is very concerned about the private property aspect of carbon capture sequestration, the erosion of private property rights. And so these two bills, the unitization bill and the eminent domain bill together are going to help to uh, solidify uh, landowners' rights to their property and give them more leverage and more say in whether or not their land can be seized through eminent domain for carbon capture sequestration. Hopefully these will be. And I believe that Representative Guyman mentioned to us earlier today, Danielle, I believe he said that he expects these two bills to be voted on this week. Yes, I believe so. So looking forward to seeing the, the green lights light up on this one. Absolutely. All right. Next is House Bill 763 by Representative Bowie. And this one is his Biden Bucks bill that he came on earlier this week and talked to us about getting federal money and federal directives out of Louisiana elections because he is a self-proclaimed state sovereignty guy. He said it. He said, Chris, I'm for state sovereignty. I don't like the idea of the federal government coming in and telling us how to run our elections, dumping a bunch of money on us, and then trying to control us. Uh, and so this bill will prohibit the state of Louisiana from implementing any federal election decrees or accepting any federal election money without legislative ratification from both houses. I think it's a very, very good bill. As you said, Representative Aboye talked about this at some length on our show recently. I'd be pretty surprised if this does not get called and passed. Yeah. But I never I expect- but you never know because know. we have some globalists and some rhinos in our legislature. Yeah. Not as many as we used to though. Thank God for thank God for the state of freedom in LeCag. <laughs> That's right. That's right. All right. Well, we've made it through the bills that are pending in the Senate now up to the bills that are pending final passage in the House. The first one is Senate Bill 208 by Senator Miguez. I always want to call him Representative Miguez, but it's Senator now. And this is his sanctuary policy bill. um, And it passed House and Governmental Affairs in a 10-3 party line vote. And this one is scheduled to be uh, debated on the House floor tomorrow or yeah. Monday. Yes. And the bill should pass. And it simply prohibits Louisiana or any parish within the state of Louisiana from ever becoming a sanctuary state or sanctuary parish for illegal immigrants. Uh, and it's a very, very good bill. Uh, and, and it requires 
uh, any law enforcement uh, organization that has implemented uh, any policy of sanctuary type refuge for illegal immigrants uh, that they have to dismantle it. Uh, I don't know that any local law enforcement agencies have done that yet, but this legislation would prohibit it going forward uh, and make sure that Louisiana is a place where people who have entered the United States legally and are here legally are welcome and not a sanctuary harbor for people who have broken the law to get into the United States. Yeah. And the next couple are related to elections, Chris. The first one is Senate Bill 420 by Senator Valerie Hodges. This is her bill that creates the crime of election fraud or forgery. Yeah, don't go that in. That one, sorry. No, you go ahead. <laughs> sorry, that one does not uh, have a date yet for it uh, to be to be debated on the House floor. Yeah, and it just don't go in to uh, a voter registration office or into uh, a, a you know to a polling place and try to register to vote or vote using false pretense by lying about who you are by lying about whether you're a legal uh, whether you're in the United States legally whether you're a citizen by assuming someone else's identity don't do any of those things or you can and will be arrested and criminally prosecuted and probably put in jail for doing it uh, this is a very timely bill in light of the current political climate in our country, Danielle, with people pouring over our southern border. Uh, the legislation could not come at a more critical time. That's right. And next up are two bills by Senator Klein Peter, uh, Senate Bill 155 and 218. The first is his bill that would restrict who can help a person, a vulnerable voter with their mail-in ballot, mail-in absentee ballot. And the second is who could help a person um, who needs assistance inside of the voting booth. Yes. This this uh, bill, these two bills collectively limit uh, 90, 95% of the assistance provided to vulnerable uh, voters must co- be provided to them by family members, by people who are immediately related to them, whether it's assisting them with their absentee registration, their absentee voting, or their in-person voting at the polling place. And this, again, Danielle, as we've talked about before, is to prevent this you know, plethora of third-party activist, activist groups preying upon vulnerable voters, getting them to do what they want to do, indoctrinating them, and getting them to vote the way they want them to vote. Uh, leave vulnerable voters alone. Let their family members help them and, and, and just stay away from them. The thought of them being preyed upon by third-party activist groups is just disgusting to me. And this bill will prevent that. Yeah. Very, very glad that Senator Klein Peter brought both of these. And I think we should not see too much trouble getting those passed, right? I, I would I would seriously doubt it. Yeah. Okay. Next up is Senator Hodges, SB 388. It creates the crimes of unlawful entry and re-entry into an alien uh, by <laughs> by an alien into this state, and aliens Chris, Senator, aliens are uh, aliens from outer space. We're not sure whether or not they're they're hovering around or not, but we don't really have the mechanism right now to prohibit them. But we're working on it. Well. I wonder if this covers that, you know, we say, hey, aliens are prohibited. Uh, you know what? I'll be honest with you. I could we could make a pretty good argument that that would include <laughs> uh, aliens who are hovering above this mortal coil. Yeah, I'm not sure that they will um, submit Honor. to earthly authorities. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure <laughs> that they'll say, oh, you have a law against us. Let oh me get out of here I, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Getting us back on track. Uh Senator Facey, Chris, mentioned that he is trying to add his bill, um, the one that would pull people over who who cre- had some violation, check their citizenship status should it appear that they were here unlawfully. He is trying to add that bill as an amendment onto this one. Yeah. And when we had Senator Hodges on, she explained her bill, SB 388, as very, very similar to Senator Facey's bill. Both bills would accomplish very similar objectives. So as you said, I believe that Senator Facey is simply trying to get certain provisions of his bill attached to Senator Hodges' bill as an amendment and then get SB 388, Senator Hodges' bill, on through. Uh, hopefully that will happen and have a good solid bill that will 
impose real penalties for unlawful entry and reentry into the state of Louisiana. Yeah, I hope so as well. All right. Last up for final passage in the House or pending final passage in the House this coming week is House Bill 312 by Representative Chuck Owen. And this is his ivermectin over-the-counter bill. Yeah, and and, uh, Representative Owens gave some very compelling remarks on the House floor last week about why ivermectin should be available over-the-counter, but he pulled the bill back uh, because at the behest of uh, Dr. Ralph Abraham, who's the head of the Louisiana Department of Health. Um, I don't, we don't really know exactly why uh, Dr. Abraham wants this to be pulled back, but he does. Uh, and this isn't the only bill that he has requested be pulled back. Uh, there are a couple other bills that we'll talk about in due course, health-related bills, parental consent-related bills for minors, that he's asked to be pulled back. So we're going to hopefully be able to have a conversation with Dr. Abraham and ask him uh, why, because we really don't fully understand. I know he's a good man. I think he's a good American. I think he tries to do the right thing. But there are several bills that he has requested, the author of those bills, pull back that are good bills. And this is one of them. And we're going to try to figure out why that's the case, uh, because our listeners certainly have a right to know why ivermectin a very, very harmless drug, a drug that has been used throughout the world uh, to to solve all manner uh, of illnesses, could not be available over the counter. Do you know, Danielle, I I heard yesterday on a couple of days on the news, uh, there was a doctor, a very prominent doctor who said that ivermectin is second only to penicillin as the most widely used and important medication in the world right now, wow. ivermectin. Wow. Uh, and so, you know, and it, and it's, it, it's just a, it's a very, it's a, so, so people have a right to know why this law would not be on the books at the end of this session. And we expect to find the answer to that. Yeah. And, you know, Chris, we have talked to Representative Owen. He did say there's some complications because of the the way that the drug is handled or categorized by the FDA. But I don't think our attorney general would have any problem going toe to toe with the FDA if this bill got challenged as a law. No, I don't think so. The CDC has regulatory authority in Louisiana. The FDA does regulate uh, ivermectin. But, but the bottom line is this. We are a state, and if we, if we want to allow ivermectin to be available over the counter, I think we should pass the bill, move forward, and if there's a constitutional challenge, go fight it. We live in a day and age when state sovereignty is very much on the line. We have a federal government that has demonstrated it, that it, there, it has no capacity for self-limitation. It is suffocating the rights of states and the rights of citizens within those states. And there comes a time when you simply have to fight on these issues. And I think that this is one of those issues. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, Chris, states have not had, blue states have not had one ounce of problem asserting state sovereignty when it comes to legalizing marijuana use, which is a scheduled drug by the FDA, by uh, probably the, the, I think the DEA, you know, it's not, it's not been completely liberalized across the country. So if that's the case, then there should be no reason, there should be nothing standing in the way of us trying to assert our sovereignty to be able to deal, to have available over the counter to anyone who is um, an adult that wants the wants the product to be able to protect themselves or to be able to uh, have access to this life-saving treatment. So I, I, I just, I don't take the weak arguments. Um, and I, I, frankly, you know, I would love to see this play out. I know you would. And and the example that you use about the marijuana is a perfect example that the Tenth Amendment Foundation gives when they talk about state sovereignty and and, and the state's rights to simply ignore or refuse to enforce federal decrees. The federal government prohibited marijuana, but many, many states simply refused to enforce the law. So guess what happens? Slowly but surely, marijuana has become more and more liberalized throughout every state in the country. Uh, and that's sort of how it works. It was an assertion of state sovereignty. There's no question about it. And, and um, we have a right to govern and regulate 
the health of our citizens. And this bill simply would have allowed us to do that, would have given us another tool to do that. And again, it's important for us to find out and have a discussion with Dr. Abraham uh, about why, uh, what the issue is, was regarding this legislation. Yeah. And we intend to do that. All right. Well, coming up next in committee, there's only one bill that we're really following this week in committee, or it's, and it's not even a bill, it's a resolution. Coming up on Tuesday in House Health and Welfare is House Resolution 214 by Representative Chuck Owen, and he is requesting that the Attorney General investigates whether certain companies violated any laws in the production, distribution, or sale of COVID-19 vaccines. Chris, you know I could not be prouder or happier to see this resolution get brought to this committee. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I mean, you, you you brought it to my attention several times. And, you know, if you were to translate this bill uh, into sort of layman's terms, uh, basically he's directing the attorney general to uncover corruption, in that process, uncover corruption, graft, and self-dealing in the production, the sale of those COVID vaccines. And I guarantee you, uh, if it's done objectively and done thoroughly, they're going to find some corruption. Believe me. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too, especially if the corporations that are being investigated involve some of the large conglomerations, not just the pharma companies that spring immediately to mind, but some of the large conglomerations in the state that administer the vaccine. So that will remain to be seen. Well said. Okay, well, let's get into a recap of last week. Um, there was quite, quite a lot that happened. And Chris, um, I'm going to throw you a curveball here because this one was not on our list, but I just remembered it while we were talking. Um, but I'm not concerned that you're going to have any problems talking about this one. It's House Bill 904 by Representative Chenevier. This was her DEI reporting mandate for by all public schools, K through post-secondary schools. Yes. And it, 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 it's simply an exercise, Danielle, of legislative oversight. The legislature has plenary oversight authority over public educational institutions in Louisiana. And they are making a request, in fact, a demand for secondary and post-secondary education uh, institutions in Louisiana to provide them all of the information related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. What kind of programs are you teaching? What's the slant of the programs? Send us the lesson plans and tell us how much of taxpayer money you're spending on these programs. There's a lot of skepticism about diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, the, 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 indoctr the ideological indoctrination that goes along with it, uh, the leftist slant, the tendency to teach people to hate their country, to dislike each other, to view everything through the prism of either race or gender, to teach that the foundational principles of our country, like the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, are structurally racist, that the earth is our mother, and all the rest of it, we, the, the legislature is saying we want to know what is being taught to our kids, to our students using taxpayer money. Give us the goods. Give us the information. Good bill. Uh, and I, I can't wait to see what is provided and what is uncovered. Chris, I have to tell you, I, I never had this thought before, but while you were talking, I was just like, you know, I wonder what it'd be like to sit through a biology class where they explain to you the physics of how the earth is your mother. You know what? And and that is, uh, to be honest with you, that is when they give the explanation, the scientific explanation of the birthing process, I'm going to be moved. I will be exiting the room. I will be seeking rapid egress and I will be going down the hall, hiding out in a closet somewhere, maybe even jumping off the roof because I'm not sure that my life would not be inalterably changed once the biological birthing process of the earth giving birth to me and you and the rest of humanity. I'm not sure that I necessarily need to know about that. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's one of the more ridiculous things you could possibly imagine. So maybe maybe we can get someone to send us the curriculum and we'll read it on air. Yes, we'll, we'll just read it on air and <laughs> and we'll and we'll preface everything we say with hypothetically only, just so we can get through it without having a major upheavals. <laughs> Look, that bill passed Senate education last week, and the final vote will be on the Senate floor. All of the bills that I am about to outline that we are going to discuss do not have dates yet for when they will be, when they'll have their next debate, but they they will uh, possibly happen this week because we know things are going to start moving even quicker than they have been. And Chris, you know, we were talking earlier this week, I mentioned to you, I heard that a university in North Carolina pulled all of the funds that it had dedicated to DEI and instead redirected those to the school police. And I really love that idea. I think that as you, as you mentioned to me, Representative Chenevere's bill could, in theory, give us really good accounting numbers for how much money is being spent, how much time um, in terms of money is being spent on DEI. And then we just take all of those dollars back and we put it somewhere a lot more meaningful. So maybe it will be on American history. Maybe it will be on um, the state police. Maybe it will be somewhere else. But I tell you what, it deserves to be someplace that serves the people of this state and does not try and destroy the minds of children. Amen. No more, no more DEI. No more yeah. DEI in, in, in Louisiana. By the way, just so people will know, Danielle, Valerie Hodges had a resolution last year. I believe it was H- right. HR 13, House Resolution 13, maybe HCR 13, uh, which was substantially the same as this. And she was attacked in the education committee viciously because I was there for being a racist and for being race, bringing racist legislation simply for asking the legislature to exercise its oversight authority and make a decision or determination about you know the nature of these programs, how much money is being spent on it, and that sort of thing. So uh, she brought this last year and, and was killed in the education committee, uh, sadly, uh, but it hasn't been, uh, Chenevere's has not been, and, and let's, let's just get this passed. Yeah, well, and Senator Hodges has been a trailblazer back from her time in the House, and we will be getting to a couple of her bills shortly um, that are fantastic. But first, let's talk about House Bill 975, Chris. This is Representative Dodie Horton's bill that would make, uh, that would basically say that parents once again have the right to determine what medical procedures and treatments their minor children have. Yeah, and it, and it's dead. The bill is dead because uh, LDH and Dr. Ralph Abraham uh, wanted to to ask Representative Horton to pull the bill back, uh, and because they want to look at all the parental consent laws in Louisiana, they want to reconcile different statutes and make sure apparently that everything is consistent, uh, and so they want more time to look at this, both with regard to the parental consent for physical health care procedures and the parental consent with regard to any kind of mental health care services. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about the explanation that has been given uh, by the Department of Health for why they encourage this legislation to be pulled back. The reason why I'm concerned is that right now in Louisiana, minors can receive both mental and physical health care services without parental consent or notification. I would have never thought that that would be the law in the state of Louisiana, but Paige Lowry pointed that out to me, and it, in fact, is the law. So with this legislation being pulled back for another year, we're looking at one year between now and next year, assuming we get legislation passed in 2025. But for the next year, we're looking at a situation where children could be very vulnerable and very exposed. That's why this concerns me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's concerning. And Chris, you and Paige had a very elegant solution to this bill that was going to make the bill, what, six lines long? Oh, it would have been very, very short. And all it would have said was, notwithstanding any provision of law to the contrary, no minor under the age of 18 in Louisiana will receive any physical or mental or pharmaceutical health care procedure, something along those lines, without 
informed written consent except in case of an, of an emergency. That was basically what it said. Why would that be controversial? Why would anybody in the state of Louisiana not understand the importance of a bill like this to prohibit minors from getting any kind of medical or healthcare procedure without their parents' consent and knowledge. Why would that be controversial? Someone is going to have to give me and you and others a very good explanation for why the Department of Health wanted this legislation pulled back. I know Representative Dodie Horton is sincere. She's a very good legislator. Uh, but she she deferred to the Louisiana Department of Health. And I'm not going to know pro or con whether that was a good thing to do or not until we get a firm explanation from the Department of Health on this. Yeah, yeah. And I'm very hopeful that we will get a, a good conversation out of that, Chris, because, I mean, we have no reason to believe that um, Dr. Abraham's um, not sincere in this, but my my concern, and I think yours as well, is that this um, this legislation is not complicated. And should it run afoul of some other um, existing law, will you cross that bridge when you get to it? Legislators pass bills every single day in session that run into problems with other bill, other ex- existing statutes, and that doesn't slow them down. So, um, on something of this magnitude. Um, and, and something that impacts or stands to impact children in such a massive way, such a long-term way, such a consequential way, I would like to see action taken sooner than later, and we can fix the laws as the need arises. This is way too important to do anything else. Way too yeah. important. I'm excited to share a fantastic opportunity for State of Freedom listeners who are interested in investing in precious metals or even starting a home-based business in the precious metals industry. Metal Stacks is a precious metals collector's club where you can buy your metals at the best prices on the market, actual dealer cost. They are beating the big sites. They have no credit card fees and no minimums. If you're just interested in purchasing metals at a great price, visit metalstacks.com forward slash dwalker. Get to shopping. That helps me out. I get the commission. You can also refer people to Metal Stacks for an additional income. If you're interested in learning about the referral business aspect of Metal Stacks, email me directly at danielle at freedomstate.us for more information. Okay, well, now we'll get to two bills uh, by Senator Hodges. The first one is six tw- uh, sorry, 262. This is her bill that would expand the Parents' Bill of Rights for Public Schools. And basically it says that your kid can't be taught that they are an oppressor or the oppressed or destined to become one of those. Only in 2024, uh, United States of America, would legislation like this be needed or be required. But in this woke cancel culture that we live in, uh, yes, it is needed. And yes, her legislation would prohibit any child from being taught that they or are an oppressor or oppressed or likely to become an oppressor or oppressed in the future. They can't be taught that. Uh, and, you know, basically just an effort to keep uh, the poison the, the leftist woke poison out of our schools. Yeah. Well, this bill did pass in House education, and it was basically a party line vote because Barbara Freiberg took her place again with the Democrats in opposition of this bill in a total head scratcher. I don't see how anyone could say, stand up and say, you know what, I want my child or my grandchild or my niece or nephew to be taught that they are destined to either become an oppressor or an oppressed person. Let's, let's make everyone a victim or an aggressor. That's absolutely insanity to me. This is not yet scheduled for debate on the house floor. Uh, I mean, yeah, you always count on Babs to come through the clutch. That's right. Babs. All right. Senate Bill 294, also by Senator Hodges. This one confirms the protections of free speech and the First Amendment and and First Amendment protected activities on college and university campuses. Yes. And a very, very good bill. And yet uh, another effort on the part of Senator Hodges to make sure that that uh, 
that the First Amendment, freedom of expression, freedom of speech is honored on campuses in Louisiana. Uh, and God knows we need it because of the things that are occurring on way too many of our campuses, the way that uh, conservative speech is being suffocated, uh, oppressed, intimidated, uh, and really stamped stamped out. It's just not welcome uh, in the public square on college campuses on way too many of them uh, these days. So this, this bill calls attention to that fact and reiterates in our statutory law constitutional protections for speech on college campuses and uh, universities in Louisiana. It's a very important bill. Uh, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Danielle, that even Babs voted for this. Yeah, well, sh- it passed House education unanimously. So even Babs voted for it. And Chris, I think it even goes further than just protecting free speech and reasserting the First Amendment. It also says what is not acceptable, which is criminal behavior and any um, organized speech, I believe. And I could, we may have to take a look at this if I'm, I'm not a hundred percent right on no, this. No, you're right. But if you're, if you, if your speech is not, um, if it's being paid for by outside foreign influences. If it's being paid for by outside foreign influences that are adverse to our country, then it is not protected. Uh, yes, that's exactly right. And, and as course, my sister, as my sister astutely pointed out, if you're getting paid for it, it's not free speech. It's paid speech. It's paid speech. Exactly. And of course, any criminal conduct or behavior would not fall under the free speech protections. Um, but yeah, it is. Danielle, we live in a country now and in a state now where big multi-billion dollar uh, groups <clears throat> are paying people to engage in certain behaviors and to engage in certain speech that directly undermines the fabric of this country and of this republic. And that is one of the things that uh, Representative Hodges is calling attention to in this bill on campuses. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Senator Hodges. Okay, next up is House Bill 25 by Representative Danny McCormick. It is his vaccine liability bill. Chris, this bill suffered the same fate that it was trying so hard to avoid as Michael Eccles HB 87 did two weeks ago. What happened with the bill and remind us what it did? Well, the, the bill, McCormick's bill would have prohibited any business from being discriminated against or retaliated against in any way, any employer, or any business, uh, if they refuse to mandate any experimental or emergency use authorization vaccine on the, on any employee or customer. So if a business chooses not to impose that on their employees or their or their customers, they can't be punished by the government either through administra- a lawsuit or any administrative fines or in a, any permitting process. They just have to leave them alone and let them make that decision. Well, this failed in 2 to 1 in Senate Judiciary A. Danielle, two in a two to one vote. Both Pathetic. De- yes, both two Democrats voted against it. Senator Edmonston, the Republican, voted for it. He was the one vote. And Senator Seaball and Senator Mizell, both Republicans, apparently were out of the committee room presenting legislation in other rooms. I surely wish that they had been in there for this important legislation. That's all I can say. Uh, it's yeah. just, I mean, it's That's- like, wow. Wow. Yeah. Tragic. It, it, it is tragic. It is tragic, you know, and, uh, you know, hopefully he'll be able to get this. Maybe there's another way to get this across the finish line. I hope so. I certainly hope so. And I, I would expect that Senator Seabaugh and Mizell would have both voted for this should they have been in the room, oh, which is I, just, I no it's doubt. so disappointing. It's very um, disappointing. But, you know, you can only be one place at a time. Well, you know what? And he and they, they may have had legislation that was extremely important that they had to handle, you know, yeah. so, so they've, they've got exactly. to handle their well, own business. Exactly. And the next bill up is by Senator Seabaugh. So perhaps this is the the bill that he was presenting at the time, Senate Bill 357. This is his bill that is about terminating a public health emergency as declared by a governor. Yeah. And, and this basically says it clarifies the fact that either House, either the Senate or the House, can vacate on their own a emergency declaration, health declaration, and importantly, 
the bill eliminates the requirement that the legislature has to consult with LDH, Louisiana Department of Health, before they can vacate an emergency health decree. And that's a really, really important part of it. You remember LDH during COVID, and you remember the governor we had during COVID. Lord have mercy. I mean, they just would not set us free. They just wanted to continue to lock us down, to continue to oppress us, continue to keep us in our homes, continue to pressure people to get this experimental vaccine. It was like they would not leave us alone. And Senator Seabaugh did everything that he could to get that emergency declaration and decree terminated, but could not do it because of weakness in the House, in the legislature. So this legislation just simply will allow one chamber to be able to do it on their own and no more requirement that we have to sit down and consult and negotiate with LDH, which has less credibility than than just about any administrative agency I can think of in my lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. This bill, Chris, passed House Governmental Affairs nine to five in a party line vote. And the next stop for it along the track is going to be House floor for debate, but it's not yet scheduled. Okay, next up is House Bill 577 by Representative Carver. It prohibits social media tracking and ad targeting, excuse me, of minors. This one passed Senate Commerce unanimously. I really enjoyed some of the debate in there. It was mostly, I don't know how much debate it actually was. It was more... um, strong commentary by our by by some senators uh on the on the committee who were very su- suspicious of one of the guys giving testimony it was a lobbyist from out of state testifying on behalf of free social media for everyone free unfettered access yeah a lobbyist from Missouri was talking about uh warning against uh imposing these restrictions on big tech and big social media insofar as their targeting of minors and their selling of the data of minors and their advertising, uh, t- you know, focused on minors. Uh, and, you know, and, and a couple of members of the committee said, uh, I believe it was Senator Abraham said, well, Mr. So-and-so, I can't remember the guy's name, uh, you make you make some some pretty good points. You're right that the government can't do all of this, and parents are responsible for monitoring this stuff. But it's not an either or situation. Number one and number two, doesn't your organization make its money off of complete unrestricted um, access <laughs> uh, on the uh, on, on on the internet and and with big tech and big social media being able to, to to advertise to whomever they want whenever they want, including minors, isn't that sort of how your uh, your uh, your organization is funded? And so he was kind of busted uh, at that point by Senator Abraham. Senator Connick asked some very pertinent questions and some good questions on the bill as well. And and Representative Carver did a really good job, frankly, presenting the bill. Uh, and it's a very important bill that simply protects our minors as much as can be done on social media from these vultures who target them. Yeah. Very happy to see that passed. And it is not yet scheduled for House floor debate. So, uh, sorry, Senate floor debate, because that will be the last stop for that one. Last stop. Next up. Yeah. Next up to bills by Representative Bacala, House Bill 48 and 49. Both would be constitutional amendments related to the budget. Both passed Senate and governmental affairs last week, and neither are scheduled yet for House floor debate. Yeah, they ought to call both of these uh, bills the please give us time to let us see what we're voting on legislation uh, so that we're not in the situation for two hours before a session is scheduled to end, and we have hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of appropriation bills that we have to look at that have been sent over from the Senate that we don't have time to look at, uh, and yet we have to vote on these items and we don't know what we're doing. So 40, HB 48 simply allows a two, two additional days uh, when needed Uh, that they can vote and have two additional days to vote on any appropriations bill so they know what they're doing. And then uh, House Bill 49 would, if I'm not mistaken, allow the legislative session to to be extended by two days at a time if they need, if they're coming up on the end of a session. 
Yep, exactly. 48 is the 48 hour rule and 49 is the two day extent session extension should they need it. 48 hour being even even if they're within well within the session, they can't force them to vote yes. on on something without giving them at least 48 hours to review it if it's an appropriations bill. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, next up is a bill that was brought to our attention by a uh, LACAG member, Burke Colley, and it is House Bill 962. He's been following it very closely, and I believe he testified on this one as well, Chris. He's quite passionate on this issue. It's House Bill 962 by Representative Billings, and it's related to the preparation and counting of mail-in absentee ballots. Right. And and the, 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 the bill itself relates to a quorum for local boards of election supervisors and, and how many need to be present and how they can vote, That's, which is the principal part of the bill is good. The big concern was that there was an amendment added to the bill that says specifically that no, none of the processes of the uh, Board of Election Supervisors when it comes to the tabulation, the counting, and the processing of earlier absentee votes can be video recorded in any way, shape, or form. There can be no video record of it. I mean, and and Bert was like, well, I am a member of, a, of an election supervisory board, and I believe that citizens have a right to know what's going on when it comes to the way that they're apt, the way these votes are processed and counted. And the idea that, that there would be a categorical prohibition of any video or audio recording of it is just not acceptable. And so because of Bert's good work and because of some attention made to it by LeCag and the State of Freedom, that amendment to prohibit uh, video recording has now been stripped off of the bill. The only thing that it still prohibits is live streaming of it. But there can be, for instance, a, a video uh, re- recorder like in the top corner of, of every building where the, where the local board of election supervisors meets in the in the state every parish where they could where it could be recorded all of their official processes could be recorded so in the event that there's ever a challenge or ever a concern about how something was processed or a vote they could go back and look and see how it was done i think this is really important for purposes of verification we're talking about the processing and the counting of thousands and thousands of early and absentee votes and i think that the idea that any election official officials would be able to do this process without anybody being able to know whether it was done correctly and with no objective verification of how it was done. I just think that that's acceptable. And I'm glad that Bert sounded the alarm on that. Yeah, me too. And I think there's probably some kind of middle ground for the for the live stream, Chris. Maybe it's a sequestered group of people can watch the live stream. I understand that they don't want anyone to be able to see votes as they're being tabulated or being able to see who voted how. But but I think there. look, it's 2024. We can figure this out. It's 2024. We absolutely can figure it out. Yes. Okay. Okay. Next up is Senate Bill 371 by Senator Regina Barrow. This is her bill that would provide for the potential for chemical castration of pedophiles. And that one, Chris, passed House criminal justice unanimously. No one was willing to stand up for the pedophiles. No one was willing to stand up for the pedophiles. There was a period of time when it was challenged by Royce Duplessis on the floor. I thought maybe for a second it was going to come up short, but it it did not, and it ended up passing. And now, um, you know, based upon the discretion of the sentencing judge, uh, someone who has been convicted basically of child molestation or pedophilia uh, kid could be castrated as one of the components of their penalty before they are released from prison. Yeah. Uh, as as the saying goes, you win, uh, you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. And I, I believe that. Uh, you, let me tell you, I, uh, you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes, uh, and this would be you know, an awfully stupid but but uh, very consequential prize that they would win. That's right, and well-deserved prize. All right. That one also is not yet scheduled for House floor debate, but that is also that's going to be the last stop for that one. 
Next up is House Bill 957 by Representative Edmund Jordan. And this one we've talked about quite a number of times now. It, it kind of got um, held up. You know, it was, it was uh, scheduled for committee. It was in House Transportation. It got voluntarily deferred from House Transportation. It went over and was reassigned to House Insurance Committee. And I didn't think too much of that when it got moved to House Insurance Committee, but I, it did it did kind of cause a little bit of head scratching for me. This bill prohibits vehicle manufacturers in its original form and distributors from sharing driver information without the driver's consent. However, now that it moved to the House Insurance Committee, the bill instead prohibits insurance companies from using that telematic data to make decisions about your policy, whether to take you on or not as a person, whether to raise your rates. And Chris, this, okay, that's great. You know, that I, I think that's a good development, but it substantially weakens the bill. It completely changes the meaning of the bill. Why should these insurance companies have access to that data at all to start with? And of course, who is policing the insurance companies when they're looking at your data? Exactly. Two huge problems with this. Number one, if they're going to be prohibited from using the information to determine rates, then why do they need the information to begin with, uh, number one? And number two, who is going to be policing and determining whether or not they're using this information, in fact, to, to increase rates? Insurance companies can be very, very sneaky doing things for one reason while giving the appearance that they're doing it for another reason. There's nothing good that can come from allowing insurance companies to have access to this type of information on a driver. And they're, and it's, it's going to be bad, and it's going to drive insurance rates up for drivers. Yeah, it will. And I just think... You know, this is so far from the original intent of the bill. I was so excited to see this bill when it was originally put out. And now, I, I, look, I still want to see it passed because obviously the insurance companies are already getting our data. So this will be helpful, but it doesn't go nearly far enough. And that's that's upsetting to me. This bill, Danielle, would have stopped the practice of insurance companies yeah. getting our data if it had passed it in original form, right? Yeah. It would have stopped it without, unless we consented to it, right? Unless we consent to it. And, uh, yeah, unless we consented to it. But the insurance lobby obviously put the full court press on Representative, Representative Jordan. That's the only only explanation. Okay. Well, next up is House Bill 46 by Representative Kathy Edmonston. She has brought this one before as well, Chris. This is her no vaccine mandate to attend schools bill. Yes, and and thank God for Kathy Edmonston that once this is passed and signed by the governor, no school child in Louisiana in any public or private school ever again will be mandated to take the COVID shot. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Representative Kathy Edmonston. So so past due, so much needed that they will never have to worry about this again. Beautiful. And believe it or not, Chris, it passed Senate education without opposition. So that's awesome. That is awesome. The next couple of bills actually passed Senate Ed without opposition. That is a really great committee. The next one up is House Bill 121 by Representative Cruz. It's his pronouns in schools bill. Yeah. Billy is not Bobby. Uh, call people by the names that are on their biological birth certificate. And, it, it, you know, and if you have a parent's consent to call them something else, you can do it. Uh, but without that, just refer to young boys and girls in school by the name and by the gender that is consistent with their biological birth certificate. Once again, only in 2024 uh, would we need legislation to address this issue. But unfortunately, we need it. Representative Cruz rose to the challenge and let's get it through because we need it. Yeah. And House Bill 122 by Representative Dodie Horton is a close companion to this one. And it her bill prohibits inappropriate sexuality or gender related conversations 
at schools being initiated by um, a teacher or administrator. That's exactly right. Keep your private lives to yourself. Teach reading, writing, and arithmetic, and don't attempt to indoctrinate students with sexual concepts uh, that are both completely inappropriate for their age and probably inappropriate in a school setting at any time, at any age. Yeah, exactly. And this last one that was heard in uh, Senate education and passed also with no opposition was House Bill 320 by Representative Chuck Owen, and it repeals woke teacher training and authorizes Bessie to adopt new standards. And consistent with the new Bessie board that we have, very appropriate that this uh, current current regulations uh, would be repealed and would give the new Bessie board a clean slate uh, to to revise and improve impose new, new decrees and a new policy with regard to teacher training and to student instruction. Yeah. So this last set of bills were all are all pending final vote in the Senate. They have not been scheduled yet, but we could probably expect to see them by maybe Wednesday at the earliest, I would imagine, maybe, maybe later this week. Yes. Uh, we've got, All right. Yeah, I'm telling you right now, Danielle, we're going to finish strong. We are going to finish strong. And we just have a couple left. So there are a couple big wins we wanted to report on. There are a couple bills that are pending uh, conference committee. The first one is House Bill 238 by Representative Michael Eccles. This is his bill that would protect our agricultural land from the purchase uh, from purchase by foreign adversaries. So people who hate us and want to kill us or want to end our country, our right to be here, um, cannot buy our land. Great bill. It passed 38 to nothing in the Senate, Chris. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because of sort of the way that you put it, that if you want to kill us, uh, and you know you're you're a nation that wants to kill us and disable our infrastructure and undermine our republic. Then perhaps you shouldn't be purchasing immovable property in the state of Louisiana. Well, that's what Representative Eccles' bill does, House Bill 238, uh, and uh, it's just it's just it's a no brainer. Uh, and uh, as I said on the last show, Danielle, I'll be really interested to see uh, if there are any Republicans who oppose this or vote against this legislation. Yeah, well, it's it's all the way through. The only question is, how does it happen in the conference committee? And we, sh- you know, everyone just be very prayerful that it moves without any hindrance through there. In the conference committee, we'll see. We can we'll see what happens in well, the conference true. committee. Uh, but I just want want them to know we're keeping a very close eye on this because it's not over. Now we're on the one yard line. There's no question about that. But we're not in the end zone quite yet. Uh, let's get it in the end zone. Yeah. Yep. The next two were still on the one yard line with as well. The next one is Senate Bill 232 by Senator Mark Abraham. And his bill is the one that will establish gold and silver as legal tender in the state of Louisiana. Chris, the final vote was 92 to one. And there was only one. Obviously, there was one opponent to the bill, and that was Representative (laughs) Polly Thomas, Republican. uh, I I don't understand. Do you think there's a possibility that that was an accidental no vote? No, I don't. I don't think it was an accidental no vote because of the question she asked in committee, Chris. In committee, when... Actually, it wasn't in this committee. It was it was a different bill, but it was the same. It was the same concept, right? She asked Representative Cruz how buying milk with gold was going to reduce the price of milk. So, no, I don't think this was an accident. And I wish I was making that up, but I'm not. I'm not. Uh, well, well, you know, um, I just had this vision of of. Uh, a representative Thomas inside the milk store trying to buy a gallon of milk. And she's very upset because uh, the price of milk had not been reduced and she stood there with her gold bar. So she just threw her gold bar and hit the, you know, and hit the, hit the clerk in the head and knocked him out with the gold bar. Uh, but look, the point is uh, representative Thomas, 
uh, we'd be willing to perhaps, perhaps, Danielle, give her the benefit of the doubt here that maybe she didn't intend to vote uh, against this legislation, but maybe she did. But but look, it's it, it was passed overwhelmingly, and it is time, it's time to get this to the governor's desk and to get this passed. Representative Cruz is for it. Senator Hodges, who also brought some gold and silver legislation. This is going to bring us one step closer, hopefully, to getting gold and silver uh, as transactional currency in Louisiana. And I know that, by the way, Dave Landry uh, has some strong opinions about the gold and silver uh, and whether or not it is a constitutional process uh, making it transactional in Louisiana. Uh, I, and, and I respect Dave Landry. And so we've got to get Dave on the show uh, and ha- get his get his side of this, because I do have a lot of respect for him. And look, and, and there are uh, there there could be more than one opinion on this. But I think uh, Dave Landry has an opinion that's certainly worth hearing. He does. But, you know, he said that. Uh... He he had an opinion, but our conversation with Senator Hodges changed his mind. So I think he has come around to to the idea of transactional gold and silver being constitutional. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I'll be honest with you. I've got the I think the world of, of Dave. I really do. He's very, very bright and he's a big supporter of, of LeCag and the state of freedom. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we, we've got we've just got to get him on. Yeah, we'll get him on to, to talk about the Constitutional Convention, which he would want me to call the convention to amend the Constitution. Yes, I was about to correct you. Yeah. All right, let's keep moving. So next up is Senate Bill 133 by Senator Presley. This is one that we have long been waiting for. This one is getting the WHO, the UN, the WEF out of Louisiana's affairs and out of the homes of Louisiana citizens. Yes, indeed. And when this finally passes and gets signed by the governor, I'm going to crank up as loud as I can the old song by The Who, one of the best rock and roll bands to ever live. And it's a song called, Who Are You? Who, 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 who? Oh, oh, tell me who are who? All right. Are you? All right. And so, it's, so, because really, we have the right to ask him at that point, Who Are You? Because you're nothing to us. And nobody to us. And so I'm going to play that song loud and clear. Get out of our lives. Get out of our state. We are not interested in your opinion with regard to how we respond to health pandemics or anything else. Leave us alone. Yeah, well said. Very well said. Don't try and sing again, though. Uh, Danielle, I'm, I'm, well, I'm sorry. My whole life, I'm going to be like the person who goes on American Idol, who's been told their whole life they really believe they have a great voice because everybody's always told them they did, and they go on there, and 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 these judges on American Idol apparently have never heard a good voice, and so they kick them off and say, you're terrible, and so the person leaves saying, I don't need you anyway. I know I have a great voice. Well, that's the way I feel about my voice. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> All right. The final vote on Presley's bill was 69 to 21. And there were several Democrats, Chris, who joined in support of that bill. And it and they are Roy Adams, Robbie Carter, Adrian Fisher, and Larry Selders. And I have to say, and I have said it multiple times, Roy Adams' name keeps coming up as someone who is voting as a free thinker. And I like it so much. I love Roy Adams more and more every time we mention his name. I've confirmed recently that he voted for constitutional carry, uh, one of a very few Democrats who voted for constitutional carry, and a number of other things he's done. Danielle, we have to have him on our show. He will be. We'll get him on after uh, we have the one and only Dave Landry. But Roy Adams, I just can't wait to talk with him. He's our kind of Democrat. Yeah. Yeah, I I I have liked what I've seen so far this session. So hats off to you, Roy. And Chris, I also want to mention that there were quite a number of people who are absent on this one, and I know that that is in large part because the Senate was having committee hearings as this at the same time that the House was having floor votes. But three names stick out because they have a track record of being absent at very very critical times and for critical votes. So I just want to mention their names. They are Paula Davis, Jeremy Lacombe, and Joe Stagney. 
the, those those people uh, they are they're I don't know why they're absent so much. Or uh, I mean, are they getting lost down there? Can they not find their way back into the chamber? But uh, yeah, but it, but it's it's amazing. I don't know what's going on, but you're right. It, it it's it's they are it's noteworthy how often they are absent on critical votes on the floor. Well, what really rubs me the wrong way on this, Chris, is why go through the process of of running for an elected office that you do not intend on executing in a meaningful way. If you don't intend on representing your constituents, why do the job? Give someone else the seat, give someone else the opportunity who has the fortitude to get in there and vote, take the tough votes. I wouldn't consider this a tough vote. Maybe they do. But at the end of the day, your job is to Represent your citizens, not to be absent. This may not, it shouldn't be a tough vote, but it's a very, very important vote. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's a very important vote that goes directly to the heart of our state sovereignty, what kind of state we're going to be. And if I'm serving in the state legislature, purporting to represent the interests, sovereign interests of citizens of a particular state, you bet your bottom dollar I would be there and made sure that my voice was heard on this vote. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, Chris, there were quite a number of people who we like and respect a great deal that were absent on this uh, vote because of of the conflict with um, with Senate committee hearings. But, you know, it, I, you have to mention the names whenever these these folks just pop up time uh, and time again. Absolutely, absolutely, and I totally understand that sometimes, even on important votes, I get it that good legislators even sometimes are absent. I totally understand that, but it shouldn't become a pattern, and that's what right. this is. Exactly, exactly. All right. Well, we are almost to the end of this. I just want to mention some final, um, so well, some bills some legislation because there's a resolution in here where the final legislative action has been taken. So we are really, really excited and pleased to to be able to bring some of these to you. The first one actually to bring all of these to you house bill 58 by representative Bacala. This is his bill that basically his anti-squatter bill. It passed the Senate 38 to zero, and it has been sent to Governor Landry for signature. Go, gone to the governor. Uh, if you're in someone's re- residence or even in someone's business, uh, you can, and they call the police, you can be arrested for simple burglary. This adds another element to the crime of simple burglary to include this action. And you can be immediately arrested and taken to jail. And the property owner will not have to go through a five-day or week-long civil eviction process to get you out. They can get you out immediately. I don't think the squatting issue is as big an issue in Louisiana, Danielle, as it is in other states. But nonetheless, it's very good preemptive legislation to keep it from happening here. It's true. And you know what? I would think that maybe um, some places squatting is a problem. It may not be necessarily illegal immigrants, but it may be, you know, in a time after a hurricane when when um, people who are homeless don't have a place to stay or in in different areas of the state where where there's some um, housing, you know, that's abandoned that people would come and and set up shop there. So perhaps maybe not in the most, uh, the way that we're seeing it, that's very jarring in people's homes while they're away on vacation and things like that. But I think this is probably going to be a very useful bill for, for the sheriffs and, and for the police. Board. Absolutely. I just, we may need to amend the bill to cover people who are not squatting, uh, who might just be just sitting or kneeling. <laughs> All right. All right. Next up is House Resolution 111 by Representative Chuck Owen, and it memorializes the United States Congress to reform the FISA, the FISC, and to restore the rights of privacy um, and unreasonable search and seizure. It passed the House 82 to zip. It's signed by the Speaker of the House and has been presented to the Secretary of State. Probably my favorite uh, resolution of the entire session. 
very much needed, encourage the U.S. Congress to reform FISA, the Federal Intelligence Surveillance Act, which allows warrantless spying by the federal government on American citizens in total violation of the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Great job, Representative Chuck Owen, this urgent request to the United States Congress to reform FISA. And God knows we need it. Yeah. We do. Next up is Senate Bill 101 by Senator Blake Miguez, and it is his ban on rank choice voting and instant runoff voting. And it is rank in the sense that it stinks, it's putrid, it's horrible, <laughs> it's rank. God, I could, it couldn't be couldn't be a better could not be better described. But uh, <laughs> uh, un- unfortunately, in this context, what they mean by rank is that the voter has to go in and rank all of the candidates in order of preference uh, and vote, cast a vote for every one of them. So if their first choice doesn't win, then it goes to the second, third, fourth. But the bottom line is this is unconstitutional. Ranked choice voting is unconstitutional because it forces voters to vote on for candidates that they do not want to vote for. We should have one man one vote, one person, one vote. You go in and you cast your ballot for the person that you want for a given race and you leave. That's what we have. That's what we should continue to have. No ranked choice voting in Louisiana. I'm so glad that Blake McGuess is bringing this legislation and I, I believe it's going to get through and and signed. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's done. It is done. The final vote was 74 to 22. There were a couple Democrats who joined um, in support of this bill. They were, again, Roy Adams, Marcus Bryant, Robbie Carter, Adrian Fisher, Steve Jackson. And it's not so, going to, and not going to conference committee. Uh, it's not. So we'll get through the, so let's just pray it gets through the governor's desk and signed. Yeah. Well, he would have no reason to not sign this bill. And Chris, I just want to mention one other thing about ranked choice voting. It's my understanding that the, okay, so you have to rank the candidates based on your order of preference, right? So let's say, um, quite a number of people vote for number one, then they say, you know what, they are my absolute first choice. My second choice is number two. My third choice is number three. The, the person who wins is not the person who gets the most votes as a first choice. It is the person who gets the most votes overall. So if everyone says, you know what, the, my third and final choice is the person is the third person on the totem pole, then I believe in in ranked choice voting, the person, even if they are the last person, if the most people put them in the last position, they can be the one who wins. Exactly. Even though they're the one, even though they are the least popular across the board. Yes. It's such a yes. joke. And it's a way, it's a way really for for uh weak candidates to dilute the results and to win elections where of the substantial majority of voters do not want them. That's exactly right. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened in Alaska with Senator Murkowski. It was the only way she was able to retain her seat because she was so wildly unpopular in the conservative state of Alaska. But she, yeah. they passed this nonsense ranked choice voting and suddenly she is um, retaining her seat as a, as a result of her unpopularity 60 percent 60 percent of alaska republicans voted for somebody other than her yet she gets in yeah so i'm very thankful that senator miguez thought ahead and and got this bill moving for us this session i it's it's a great protection for the voters in louisiana absolutely yeah. All right. And last but not least, House Bill 71 by Representative Dodie Horton. This bill requires the display of the Ten Commandments in public schools. And Chris, as I mentioned to you today, this uh, I saw it on Twitter. So there's a 90 percent chance that it's true that when the governor signs it, this Louisiana will be the very first state in the nation to require the display of the Ten Commandments in schools. Uh, I, if that's not noteworthy for, for all the right reasons, I'm not sure what is. God bless uh, Representative Dodie Horton. Uh, and I'm just so thankful for this bill. Uh, uh, you know, so so basically, and this is effective uh, on signature, I'm sure, of the governor, which means that shortly thereafter, we could begin to see uh, displays of the Ten Commandments in public schools throughout Louisiana. And 
the word of God being prominently displayed uh, is a powerful, powerful thing. So God bless Dodie Horton. Uh, and I have little doubt, little doubt that this will be signed. Yeah, very little doubt. It passed 30 to 8 in the Senate, and it was a party line vote with two Democrats joining uh, in favor of it. And they were Regina Barrow and Katrina Jackson Andrews. Nice. I'm going to have to congratulate Senator Barrow. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it, Chris. I know we we have scooted through quite a lot of legislation. I think there were 36 bills we talked about today. It's going to be a very busy week ahead, a very busy two weeks ahead. Um, but we can see that things are slowing down on the committee side, no doubt. Things are, are kind of drying up there. There's not so much work left there. Um, the, the big the big emphasis will be on the floors. We are headed toward the finish line and we are moving rapidly and relentlessly. Uh, And just, I I feel honestly like I've gotten more energy now than I did at the start of the session because I'm so excited about what we have working and what literally could be the state of law in Louisiana once uh, once we're done. Uh, I'm just very, very excited. And I'm also thrilled about our increasing presence and influence throughout the state of Louisiana as the state of freedom, the voice of constitutional conservatism in our state, revolutionizing the way political advocacy is done in Louisiana. If you are a subscriber and listener of the State of Freedom, which obviously you are, if you can hear my voice. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I know I speak for Danielle when I tell you that we are making a huge difference and are slowly but surely becoming the voice of freedom in Louisiana heard across the state. That is our goal. That is our objective. And all for you, all so that we can be the pure voice of liberty and constitutional integrity throughout the state of Louisiana and look out for you. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And if you are interested in supporting our work, you can support the state of freedom on freedomstate.us. And I don't know if I've mentioned to the listeners before, I think I may have mentioned it one time before, Chris, but the um, the scriptures and devotions that I bring for every episode are now available on our website. So if you want to take a second look at those, you can do that there. Um, super happy to be able to, to bring those to you in written form in case you want to follow the scripture a little deeper. So take a look there for that. And please also continue supporting LACAC. And Chris, this is a surprise to you. I don't think you know that. Well, you knew that this has been being worked on, but now most of the um, most of your testimony is available on LACAC.org. So if people want to take a look at how hard Chris has been working, how hard he has been fighting for you, for the voice of the citizens, for the people of the state of Louisiana, you can check out his testimony clipped. You won't have to scoot through hours and hours of um, committee hearings to to catch him. You can do it um, right there on LACAG. Just go to lacag.org, click on the latest, and you will see Chris in action. So Chris, thank you for all the hard work you've been doing for us this session. You have been a relentless fighter. There's no place that I would rather be than fighting for the citizens of Louisiana. Please continue to support and donate and know that you have German shepherds roaming the halls of the state capitol fighting relentlessly for your freedom and your liberty. And we love you. And we are just deeply, deeply honored for the continued support. And Danielle, I have to tell you, I'm deeply honored honored to be able to continue to work with you on an almost daily basis now. Uh, and it, it, as far as our, our podcasts, obviously we work together every day with LeCag and other things, but it's just such a privilege and a blessing to be able to work with someone of your spirit, uh, your tenacity, your intelligence. Uh, it's just, it's just a, a real, um, a real shot to the uh, of energy to the to the spirit and to the soul. So uh, you're the you're the absolute best, and I know that with you as my wing lady and me as your wing man and great supporters across the state of the state of freedom and the CAG, we will take grand steps each and every day to preserve the state of freedom in Louisiana. We will. Thank you so much, Chris. It's such an honor to work with you. God bless you. God bless you. 
Thanks for listening to The State of Freedom. To stay on top of all the calls to action we mentioned today, just check out the show notes for the episode. If you'd like to support the show financially, visit our website at freedomstate.us. If you'd prefer to give by mail, you can send a check to The State of Freedom, LLC, at P.O. Box 861, Burr, Louisiana, 70343. If you own a business in Louisiana and are interested in supporting our show by advertising, please email us at info at freedomstate.us. To get involved with Louisiana Citizen Advocacy Group, visit lacag.org, L-A-C-A-G dot org, or email Chris at chris at lacag.org. If you're enjoying the podcast, please subscribe and share it. Give us a five-star rating in the reviews. Thanks again, everybody. We'll see you next time.